Um, hello? Hello? Okay. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas and I am an academic researcher at Imperial College. And the main area of research I do is um, concurrency and programming languages. So you can probably see why I got interested in Go. So apart from doing uh, academic research work, I also help with um, teaching of courses at the university. So one of the course um, that I help teach is concurrency, which, uh, which aims to teach students how to model, to analyze, and to program concurrent systems. And by, by doing that, they'll learn that um, what kinds of concurrency issues will arise when you use a concurrent system, things like deadlocks or data races. But um, just a first a disclaimer that um, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is not part of the course. So um, what I'm going to talk about is very much inspired by how we teach concurrency. And, and as you probably can imagine that Go as a, as a language, it's a very good language for teaching concurrency. Um, for instance, um, the language features doesn't get really get into, into the way of um, learning about like underlying concepts. So for instance, we don't need to learn what's a public static void main, it's just func main. Um, but okay, enough rambling. So let's go into uh, what I mean by modeling. So there are a number of uh, formal models of concurrency in the literatures. So, uh, for example, there is the actor model. So, anyone heard of the actor model? Good. Um, so, it's a it's a very it's a very old uh, concurrency model that's um, in use, and one of the languages that uh, implements the actor model is Erlang or Elixir. Maybe someone's used it before. And the the idea behind the actor model is that um, you. Everything in the world of actors is, uh, there. everything is an actor. And an actor is a process or an object or thread which has a input queue attached to it. So whenever the, if you want to make an actor do something, then you send the actor a message and then the actor will react to the message and do some computation, for example, or maybe it sends a message to another actor to make it do something else. And then another line of thinking in the concurrency model is called process calculi, which is not one single process calculus, but instead it's a family of very related models with a lot of variance to model different kinds of um, concurrency. And so one of, uh, a few of the more uh, famous ones include uh, Tony Hall's CSP. Maybe you've heard of CSP before. If you read any of the Go documentations on concurrency, because Go's concurrency model is built on top of um, the ideas of CSP. And then there is also uh, Robin Milner CCS and Pi Calculus, which are also uh, very similar, similar concurrency models. And the idea behind process calculi or the model is that everything is treated as a process, whether it's a thread, whether it's a struct, everything is a process. And, and they all execute independently, they all execute concurrently. But if you want to uh, synchronize between the processes, then you need to send a message over a, a channel. And so you communicate by sending by message passing. And so these are the two more common modes of, uh, more common models of concurrency that's actually implemented. There are also lots of others that are, um, I would say equivalent like uh, patchy nets, but um, they're usually not implemented and they're usually explored only theoretically like on paper. But what I'm trying to get at it in this slide is that when we talk about concurrency model, they're all usually very abstract. They're not a real language. They're just there to give you an abstract idea of how concurrency works, how communication works. And, and when you really talk about the concurrency models, it's usually about it's on pen and paper, proofs, and, and calculus, and all that. But when you actually go to talk about um, concurrent programming, it's, we talk about a concrete language like Go, like Erlang. We pick a language, we use the language features, and most importantly, when we write a concurrent program, it's executable. So, so if you want to teach students about um, concurrency models and concurrent programming at the same time, then wouldn't it be nice if we can take the formal models that you learn about in theory and then execute it? So it's, 
if you think about it, it's more like a, a compiler that compiles the, comp the formal model into executable Go code. So this is a this is a async pi, which is a side project that I have been working on, and this is the teaching language based on one of the process calculi model called asynchronous pi calculus. Um, so the details of the model doesn't really matter too much. Um, all you need to understand is that because Go comes from the back, um, in, in Go's concurrency model, it comes from the background of uh, process calculi. So you can almost give a one-to-one -one correspondence between like the formal definitions of the model and the actual Go code. So on the left is the formal definitions. It's the formal syntax of the, of the calculus. And on the right is uh, your familiar Go code. So you can spawn Go routines. You can send messages. You can receive messages. And so the objective of this uh, tool and language is to first um, write down a machine-readable uh, representation of, of the formal processes. And once we have that, we have that in your software, we can then use it to explore how processes evolve. So we can learn about, okay, how, how does process evolve over time when we do some concurrency, when we do some message passing. And, and finally, since we've written down the, the formal model as a, as a file, as a text file that you can just read, can we generate code that actually implements this, this uh, formal process and run it in, the, in, in, in your program. So in this talk, I'm just using AsyncPy as an example of what you can do. Um, the main purpose of this is to try to implement a small, uh, maybe executable domain-specific language. And also, I want to um, discuss about some tools and packages that I find useful while implementing this uh, in implementing this small language. And so this is, this is uh, what the AsyncPy language looks like. So on the top, you see a grammar of the language. So grammars are a set of rules that governs what the syntax of a language um, it looks like. So, um, so in the bottom, I have one example uh, process language of, of, the, of the given uh, AsyncPy language grammar. And well, the objective here is to try to make this piece of, uh, this text file machine readable. So it's like a, taking a Go source code and then making it runnable and making, it, making Go understand what, what the, this text file says. And of course, this process is called parsing, which is by reading a stream of symbols, um, it could be just a, a string, like character by character, by turning it, turning it into a abstract syntax tree, following a specific grammar. So the grammar is the rules. If you follow the rules, then you can turn this into a abstract syntax tree. So for example, this is, this is uh, how we want it to do. Um, so we have the, the input file just a, as a normal string. We want to run this pass to turn it into a process, which is represented in a, in a Go data structure. And so if we run this, and this is what we get. So first, we can, we, we can get the abstract syntax tree from, from what we just passed. And second, we can actually use it like a normal Go object. So, so here, I'm just saying, OK, this Go uh, process object, we turn it into, let's display it as a calculus that we just read in. So the question is, how do we implement pass? Can we implement it just by firm scanf? So we just read one character by one character and then write a lot of code just to, just to turn this grammar, turn this language into, into the data structure? Well, it turns out there's a better way of doing this. Um, and it's called a parser generator. So a parser temp generator takes as input the grammar of your language definition. So you define the syntax of your language and then it gives you back an implementation of parser so that you don't need to do it. And, but, and, and all you need to do is to take your code, uh, take your parser, and then you say, tell the parser, so what, how are we going to implement, um, represent your parse thing into an AST or any other format that you like? Um, and it's not just uh, limited to programming languages or domain-specific languages. You can also use it to parse config files or structured data files, as long as there is a well-defined uh, grammar of that, 
that data structure, what it's supposed to look like. And so GoYak is the Go port of the Yak2, which is uh, originally written in C. So it passes, it, it reads the, the grammar file and gives you back a, a parser implemented in Go. And if you want to learn a little bit more about parsing in, with Go, um, there are good, some good articles in the Go blog on generating code and also a very good tutorial in the Go First Academy uh, where you can, you can learn exactly like what is involved in building your first own parser. But one of the, one of the problem with, with running, with um, doing, doing this kind of um, parser generation is that every time you make a change to the parser, maybe you add a new uh, feature into, into, into your mini language, you have to rerun the Go Yak2 to, to regenerate your, your implementation of the parser, otherwise it will not work. And I know what I'll do. I'll just stick it in a, a shell script and then run it every time I, I did make a change. But there is a slightly nicer way of doing it um, in the Go2 chain called Go Generate. So Go Generate is part of the Go2 chain. So it's like Go Build and, and Go Install. It's, it's all part of it. And all you need to do is instead of putting this, your, your Go Yak command in the, in, the, in the shell script, you can put it as a directive in any of the Go files. So here I put uh, this Go Yak command into, into the directive which says Go Generate. So next time when you type Go Generate without parameters, it will know that it can it will run this um, yak, uh, yak Go Yak uh, command and then it will regenerate your parser for you. And so a common misconception about uh, Go Generate is that you can only run code that generates code uh, and you can only run code that uh, is built in uh, go, but that's not actually true. You can run any arbitrary command um, for for go generate, and I've done something bad before, like putting shell scripts in there. But don't do that. <laughs> so that's our first objective. Um, we've now been able to write down a machine-readable formal process and be able to read it into Go. Have now that we have a parser, and I think the next logical step is to play with the thing that we've got from our parser to play with like what we can do with the processes. So what do we actually passed uh, in the text file into, into the Go program is actually a, a snapshot of a concurrent process. Of course, these are, these are just details that um, we don't really need to worry too much about um, in, in this talk, but I'm just trying to explain what we want to do with this, uh, with this input. So we've passed a snapshot of a concurrent system, and so in the concurrent system, there are a lot of processes and there are channels. So if two processes have the same channel, then they can communicate. So it's just like go routines and channels. And by, by doing a process called uh, reduction, so which is like uh, stepping into a debugger for concurrency. So you, you do one step and then it will do the communication and then move on to the, to the next step. And so now that we have got this process representation in Go, we can now do like implement the reduction in Go. And so this is, this is what we want to do. Uh, so we, again, we pass the, the input uh, string, string into, into the Go program as a process uh, object. And then we have a function that takes this object and does a reduction. And what we get from that is this. So before reduction, the communication hasn't happened yet. After reduction, the communication has happened, and then both of the kind of subprocess reach the end of the end of the, the execution, so they're both zero. Zero means it's an end. And because this is just normal Go code, we can go crazy with it. Um, so I have a process which is a little bit more involved. It's a, I call it a chain reaction. So this is actually just uh, one process does the communication which causes another communication which causes another communication. So it's a little bit more involved. And so then we can do a multi-step uh, reduction. So instead of doing just one step of uh, reduction at a time, we stick it into a loop and we say, you know, reduce until you cannot reduce anymore. 
So we run it, that's what we get. So we, have, we started with a very big process. And as it reduces, it gets smaller and smaller until there's nothing else you can do. So yes, that's our second objective down. Uh, now we can explore how the process evolve. And, and then so finally, we wanted to see how we can generate some uh, executable code from, from the formal definitions that we have um, in, in terms of Go. And so, of course, if you are familiar with the Go um, compiler internals, you may think, OK, so we can just use a package called Go AST to construct the AST of, of the, a Go program and then let Go does the rest of the work for us. But here, because I'm doing a very, uh, I call it a simple language, so I'm not very involved with, I don't care too much about like, uh, performance and, and whatnot. So I just use a very simple uh, text template uh, implementation that converts a, a formal model like per primitive into, into Go code. And so if we run this, which generates a Go code, just like that, it's uh, very, very simple. So, so, but as you can see, it's not a very uh, idiomatic style of a Go code. So there's, uh, everything is kind of almost in one line and then not everything is very neat. And, but, but wait, Go programmers, I think you should all know about Go firms. Who doesn't use Go firms? <laughs> Who uses Go firms? So, so everyone knows about GoFirmt, which is a tool that uh, takes your Go source code and then format it in a way that's uh, idiomatic Go. And well, it turns out there is a package in the standard library called GoFormat, which is the backend of the GoFirmt to, to uh, format Go code. And what's more, it's can, it can also, so instead of just a whole program that it can, it can format the code, it can also format snippets of code. So, so here is what I do. Um, I import the for Go format package, and then I say format.source. And then it formats the, the generated snippet of code in an in a idiomatic Go way. There is also another similar tool called um, Go imports. Um, so Go imports is like Go forms, but um, it also does handle the uh, import import packages for you. So if you're using a package that you haven't imported yet, it will add that into your import list. And if you are importing a package that you don't use in your program, the Go compiler will complain, but Go import can remove that for you so that it doesn't compile anymore. So it makes it very easy for us to make a snippet of code, add the main function, and then generate code that is a complete program. And this is exactly what I've done, and this is what I get for converting our s snippet of code into an actual Go program with a main function, which you can run on the command line. So you may think, okay, so what's the, what's the purpose of, of doing the code generation? Like, what, what's the advantage of this? Um, so if we look at uh, this uh, process definitions, which has one thread which sends a message, and another thread receive message on the same channel twice. Um, who can guess what will happen? Anyone? Let's see what happens. So this is the program that was generated from that program. Um, because I use Go import, it also, it also includes a, a imports format and, and others. And if I Deadlock, yay. Well, not yay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's my third objective. So now I have, a, I have a teaching language which can teach students how to model uh, formal concurrency and get Go code out of it. And so just to summarize, AsyncPy is a concurrency teaching language um, that I've um, just introduced. And it passes an AsyncPy process into Go program. You can play with the process programmatically, and then you can generate Go code from it in a GoFirm way. And if you want to know more about the language, 
can come talk to me. Um, I have a lot more I can say, but uh, I think I'm running out of time. So thank you very much, and thanks for your attention. Questions? Any? If you have any questions, we'll get you a throw mic. This thing, yeah, it's up. I would say it's almost equivalent. Okay, so so the question was, so what's the difference between the actor model and the and the Go CSP model? So um, the way I see it is, uh, it's more or less equivalent, um, except that in in process calculi, the channels are usually named. So um, in an, in the actor model, you can emulate you can emulate uh, you can you can emulate that with um, CSP because um, you just kind of keep your channel attached to a actor process because you cannot, you cannot address the actor process separately. Whereas in a CSP model, well, you kind of, you have the channel and the channel is how you address, how you talk to other, other processes. So basically the channel is the internal part of the process. Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can think of it like that, yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much.